I was supposed to be a teacher, but if you ask my parents, I was supposed to be a doctor. I'm either one of those things. So what did I end up doing? Well, working in media, in radio and television, behind the cameras and on screen, as a writer, a producer, an actor, and a host. Now, if you look back on your life, I'm sure you can pinpoint several key moments that really caused a major shift in the direction you thought your life was going. It's often when you say, I never thought that would happen. So I'm not talking about things that happened to you. Things happen to us all the time. I'm talking about things that you made happen with a decision. And often, it's not the easiest decision to make. Now, it's only been in recent years that I've decided to start making things happen instead of sitting back politely, quietly, and waiting for good things to happen to me. So in my experience, the biggest risks with the greatest chance of success and also the greatest chance of failure often come when you're presented with a choice. Now, I do see a choice as being a little different than an opportunity. But many times, that choice can lead to tremendous opportunities. So to me, an opportunity is something like uh, being offered an all-expenses-paid trip anywhere in the world with 10 of your friends. That's a no-brainer. It's an easy yes. But what if you had to choose between keeping your job and taking this amazing trip anywhere in the world because your boss won't give you the time off? Well, now you have to choose, and that becomes a more difficult decision. So I'm wondering who would actually pass on this trip and keep their job? Hands, anyone? Who would keep their jobs? OK, a couple of you. All right. Um, well, that makes sense. You know, you've got rent, a mortgage, car payments, uh, kids to support, Netflix to pay for and watch. Um, so I'm guessing then some of you might choose to risk losing your job and take this wonderful trip. Because who knows who you're going to meet, what you're going to see, the opportunities that might come your way. And you might not ever have this chance again. But in any situation, you have to weigh both sides. And you must plan. So I'm not talking about being impulsive. A lot of people are impulsive. They're the ones that we think are such risk takers and adventurous. We do want to succeed more than we want to fail. So what I'm saying is, Sometimes you do have those moments in life where your gut is telling you something or that there's that part of your heart that's saying you want more. There's more challenges out there, that there's more that you want to do. But then, you know, your brain is saying, don't rock the boat. We've got a job, you know, we've got a place to live, food to eat. We're better off than mo most people. Don't make a stupid decision. And I certainly don't advocate stupid decisions. But I do encourage people to create opportunities. So you know that saying, and this is one I believe for many years, you know, good things come to those who wait. Well, no one tells you how long you're going to have to wait. But there's the other saying, of course, which is life is short, and that one is absolutely true. So find a way to do the thing you've always wanted to do. And it might not mean risking everything you have, but it will involve some level of risk. So you have to prepare yourself for it. So if you think these things were instilled in me by my parents, you are totally 100% wrong. My parents raised me to take no risks at all. Go to school, work hard, get a full-time job, possibly for the rest of your life, maybe with a pension, retire. So for years after I graduated with my Bachelor of Applied Arts in radio and television, my mom kept offering to send me to school to become a pharmacist. Because it was a steady job, and you don't often hear about huge job losses or restructuring at your local pharmacy. I dressed myself for picture day that day. I was really proud of myself. That is also a Cookie Monster necklace. He's on a hammock. <laughs> that photo is not hung up anywhere in my parents' house. So I tried it my parents' way, sort of. My parents are Taiwanese immigrants. They moved to Nova Scotia in 1977. They worked seven days a week, often 12 hours a day. Unlike many immigrants, they operated a convenience store. Shocking, isn't it? It wasn't really in a very good part of Halifax. Uh, there were robberies. My mother was held up at gunpoint. Um, it was a hard living. 
and it often is for new immigrants. My father made tofu, and as you can imagine, there was a very niche market for tofu in Halifax, Nova Scotia in the 80s, but they did what they knew. So my brother and I, my younger brother, we would always go on deliveries with him. So on weekends, after school, or during the summer, we would go with my dad and we would deliver tofu because we didn't have babysitters. We didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, we didn't have family to help take care of us. My parents also, for a few years when I was very young, they operated, uh, they had a small Chinese food takeout counter in the food court of a shopping mall. And as kids, having parents who work at a shopping mall, that is kind of like being in Disney World. Um, my mother made what she calls Canadian Chinese food because I hope you all know we don't eat egg rolls or chicken balls. That's not really a thing. Um, <laughs> My parents on Saturday would also sell prepared Chinese food at uh, the Halifax Farmer's Market, which has moved locations into a new building, and that's where they remain today. So they've been there, they've been vendors now at the Farmer's Market for over 30 years. So I'm telling you this because my parents took the biggest risk of all. They moved to a new country, barely had any money, uh, didn't speak the language, but they saw all kinds of opportunities. And that's really the story, I think, of many of our parents or grandparents great-grandparents. My parents became small business owners and uh, they were able to, you know, hire some people, uh, contribute to the community and uh, have a successful small business. So I definitely fit the Asian stereotype. I was a top student. I was a really good kid. I played piano, but I hated it. I took all the science classes and math classes, even though I didn't want to. Um, I was offered several scholarships to local universities when I was uh, finishing high school. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I think it's tough to know what your calling is when you're 17 or 18 years old. But I did know I was not going to be a doctor, and my parents were very disappointed. So I accepted an offer from Dalhousie University, which is a really great local school in uh, Nova Scotia, and it came with full tuition. So at this time, I was living in the suburb of Beaverbank, Nova Scotia, which is really what it's called. Everyone thinks I make it up, but it's true, and I lived there for years, and I never saw a beaver. <laughs> at the same time that I was finishing school, um, my math teacher told me about this really great university in Toronto where you could get a degree in broadcasting. And this really excited me. I finally felt like this was something maybe I wanted to do. This was something I would possibly want to study and find out more about. I mean, I can go to school and learn to make television. There was a whole new world to me. So I applied very much on a whim. I'd never thought in my wildest dreams that I would leave home. And I had what was possibly a case study for the worst phone interview to get into a program. When the professor on the phone asked what sort of TV programs I like to watch, I think a smart person applying for this very small, prestigious program would have been very strategic and said, you know, you watch documentaries, you watch uh, 2020, 60 Minutes, the six o'clock news. Instead, I said without hesitation, I really like to watch The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and General Hospital. <laughs> So clearly, I also had no filter when I was 17. Um, anyway, they accepted me. I don't know if it was out of pity, but probably because I did have very good grades. So there I was at the age of 17, my first really big decision. And I mean, beyond things like deciding whether or not I need more hairspray in my bangs, like this was going to change my life. I had a free ride to a local university. My parents didn't have a lot of money, so they were really hoping that uh, I would have a scholarship, and I did. Or I could take out massive student loans, move far away to a big city where I didn't know a soul, and take a crack at this TV degree and years of debt. So it was full of uncertainty, but I said yes. Fast forward a couple of years later, where I cried pretty much every day for the first year or two. Um, I did uh, have some production jobs. I stayed in Toronto where I had my first job offer. I realized that a lot of jobs weren't, you know, all that creative. Certainly didn't pay that well. Um, it was somewhat unstable. And I thought, you know, maybe I'd want to try and do some on-air work. I'd always enjoyed theater when I was in school. So I discovered that uh, being female and ethnic was sometimes good, especially in a city like Toronto, but also sometimes bad. 
I even had one TV executive tell me after many rounds of auditioning that she found my mole distracting. So I have uh, quite a large mole on my face. And I thought, well, this is a visual medium. And had I had the money at that time, I probably would have had it removed. Anyway, I'm glad I didn't. So this glamorous TV industry wasn't glamorous at all. It wasn't stable. I never knew when I was going to have work. I was very stressed. I had student loans. It seemed like perhaps this was actually a terrible decision. So I applied to Teachers College in Australia. Part of me had always wanted to be a teacher. So I even paid a deposit once I was accepted. I was looking at places to live. I was going to get rid of the bare bones furniture I had. And then someone told me that a station in Toronto was hiring a new on-air host. They were launching a brand new station. They needed someone else on camera. Why don't I apply? And I was in that position where I'm like, okay, I didn't really have any experience. I'd been down this road before. I was planning for Australia, but I thought, you know what? You never know unless you try. So I put together a VHS tape. Yes, VHS. <laughs> and I sent that in. <laughs> Well, after several interviews and screen tests, I was offered this great job hosting on Omni TV in prime time in Toronto during some of the top rated shows. But I was supposed to go to teacher's college and that seemed more stable and than a job that I obviously wasn't qualified for. So I went to work for the first six months with a knot in my stomach every day. I thought, they're going to find out I have no idea what I'm doing. They're going to find my mole distracting. They're going to fire my ass. I'll be unemployed, and I won't be in teacher's college, and this is a disaster. Well, I did that job for seven years. With it came incredible exposure, experiences, and opportunities. But during those last few years, I was kind of ready to do a little bit more, you know, to have new challenges. But here's the thing. Is I had a steady salary, paid vacation days, and a mortgage. So why would I risk a good thing, even if I was just, you know, feeling like I wanted to do a little bit more? I was lucky. Well, a few things happened in 2009. I bought a condo that I really loved. I had it painted, I had lighting put in, I had things hung things designed, this was going to be my home for many, many years. And then there was this other thing called the recession, <laughs> where half of my friends lost their jobs. And the ones who did have their jobs, like myself, we were very scared to lose our jobs. And then my mom was asking if I wanted to be a pharmacist. <laughs> so I was asked if I would consider moving to Winnipeg to host the morning show, Breakfast Television, the station and the show had undergone quite a few changes, which I'm sure you know, and I was asked if I would be willing to be one of those changes. But I had just bought a really pretty chandelier. <laughs> it was nice. I wanted to eat breakfast under it every single day. So no, I said, absolutely not. I don't want to move. In fact, I had just moved eight blocks from where I lived, and that was very stressful. But part of me knew that this choice, this decision, was also a great opportunity. It was a good one and a crappy one. It would mean trading prime time for early mornings, pre-taped segments for live TV, a city that I knew and loved for one that I knew nothing about. And I accepted the job by sobbing, <laughs> which clearly gives executives and VPs a lot of confidence. So I arrived. On Thanksgiving weekend, 20, oh, 2009, in Winnipeg, with two suitcases. It snowed that weekend. I cried. I spent two years here in Winnipeg co-hosting breakfast television. Sometimes I loved it. I loved many things about it. Sometimes I hated it. Still a job. That's normal. A lot of people are really nice to me. Some people, not so much. That's life, you have to grow a thick skin. So I had been on air for close to 10 years at that point, with people always asking me, you know, how do I get a job like yours? You seem to have the dream job, the perfect job. You know, you live this charmed life, it seems so great. So you get this feeling that like, oh my God, I'm, I'm really, really lucky and I shouldn't be ungrateful. But yet, there's something more that I wanted. I felt bad for wanting 
to do something a little different, for wanting to maybe step away from it for a little while. I wanted to write more, to travel more, to do the small little projects that I didn't have time to do and just sort of too exhausted to do after doing the show. So I saved up my money months in advance. This is the planning part, and this is the not impulsive part. And one day I told my boss that I was going to leave the show. And he said, well, do you have another job? I said, no, I'm just gonna go. He's like, where are you gonna go? I'm like, I don't know. I'm gonna go, I'll end up back in Toronto. But I don't know what I'm gonna do right now. He's like, so you're gonna quit this job, and they offered me a raise, and you're going to go do something. I'm like, mom, I'm just gonna, yeah. <laughs> Put my stuff in storage, buy a ticket somewhere. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. And I did. I knew it was time to just make a change and really push myself to do what wasn't easy because I liked comfort. I liked things that were comfortable. I liked stability. And I needed to challenge myself. I really needed to see what else I could do. So I forced myself to travel. I went to Australia for a while, not for teacher's college, but to see the country that I almost moved to. And even when I was there, I realized, you know what? I could have spent the last 10 years of my life here, and my life would have been so different. Not having a steady job makes you work really, really hard. I make less money. I have more stress. I work longer days. But right now, I fulfilled that part of me that needed to see what else I could do. And the rewards have been tremendous. I worked on shows and with hosts that I'd always watched and admired from home in my living room, never imagining that one day I'd make TV with them. This is me paragliding in, uh, actually it was in New Zealand. I was terrified and then I got really sick. So, <laughs> but it was an adventure, everyone. <laughs> so people say, follow your dream. And I agree with that to some point, but part of me, really, my dream has always been to be a trophy wife and to have like a unicorn farm and neither of those things are practical. So what I say is, Follow your passion, it's slightly different, even on a small scale. You know, you don't have to quit your job, and I certainly don't advise that. But you need to make a decision sometimes that is hard, but that you know is the right one down the road. There can be extreme highs, and there can be very, very extreme lows. You know, sometimes I wonder why I'm doing this when all I really want, and I'm not joking, I talk about this a lot, is all I really want is our dental benefits. Like when the idea that someone will pay for my cleaning or a crown is really quite dreamy right now. <laughs> so sometimes the nervousness and the uncertainty of saying yes to something that you're scared of will lead to the most fulfilling opportunities. And of course, you should take this advice from me, someone who clearly learned all her life lessons from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Thank you.